Good evening, distinguished guests, students, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Locus, a student from the product, furniture, jewelry design program here at Hong Kong DI Ivy Li Wai Li. I am Ivy Ju, an architecture, interior, and product design program student. We are, we are your MCs tonight. On behalf of Hong Kong Design Institute and Hong Kong DI Gallery, we would like to welcome you all to today's master lecture, Beyond 100, Transforming Design and Imagining Futures with Left for Living. This exhibition is presented by Hong Kong DI in conjunction with Left for Living, the renowned design-led research group based within Sheffield Harlem University, United Kingdom, Sheffield Harlem University is also Hong Kong DI's long-term academic partners. Today's lecture and sharing section will examine how we envision our lives if we live to 100 years old and beyond. How can design contribute to the increasingly complex challenges confronting our aging society now and in the future? To begin the lecture, we will now have Professor Paul Chamberlain Director of Lab for Living, and Dr. Michael Tan, Associate Professor of Art and Design, Lab for Living, to tell us more about the exhibition. Due to the pandemic of COVID-19, Professor Chamberlain is not able to join us tonight in person, but we are very glad to invite him to say a few words virtually. Let us welcome Professor Paul Chamberlain. Good evening. Uh, and welcome everybody and thank you for this opportunity to contribute to the opening of this exciting event that focuses around the exhibition Beyond 100. Uh, my name is Paul Chamberlain, Professor of Design and Co-Director of Lab Living. I'm now going to share my screen and we'll start the presentation. I would like to briefly set out the context uh, of the exhibition, provide some background to Lab Living, and then in the short time we have discussed the potential opportunity and role of design in an increasingly uh, challenging world. Sheffield Hallam University evolved from the Sheffield School of Design, which was set up in 1843, one of a handful uh, of government schools set up across the UK to provide and link creativity and innovation to industry. This was the start of the Industrial Revolution, um, where the key feature was the Great Exhibition of 1851, uh, and attracted international visitors to London and to the world's first industrial trade fair. Sheffield Hallam University today is now one of the largest universities in the UK with over 36,000 students. The Beyond 100 exhibition may not be on the scale of the Great Exhibition of 1851, but it does share its approach in showcasing the value of design and creativity. The Great Exhibition focused on the products and the wares of industry at the time. In the Beyond 100 exhibition, we challenge visitors to consider not only what future project products we might uh, identify and develop to support a broad and diverse society, and in doing so improve the quality of life of people and the planet, but explore how we might utilize design beyond just products. Laugh Living emerged as an idea in 2007 that explored the potential value of design in supporting our health and well-being. It was inspired by this poem, The Four Ages of Man by Yeats. It refers to the physical, emotional, mental and spiritual aspects of aging through life. While we do not see these aspects of life as predictably sequential as presented in the poem, we do embrace these aspects of life, the physical, emotional, mental and spiritual, as key factors in the way they both enrich and challenge us through life course. Indeed, people may be born with or face challenges at any time of their life or could be fit and active well into old age. Lab Living is one of the oldest living labs in Europe. So what is a living lab? Well, the European Network of Living Labs, to which we are a member, defines a living lab as follows. A living lab adopts a user-centered open innovation ecosystem based on a systematic user co-creation approach, integrating research and innovation processes in real life communities and settings. 
Love Living adopts an interdisciplinary approach, bringing many different industries, communities, and individuals together, but with a focus on design and health. These two disciplines or subjects have many synergies. They have broad similar aims to improve quality of life, but culturally they are very different. Design traditionally encourages risk-taking, a key ingredient of creativity and innovation, while health, understandably, is risk-averse. Design is often narrowly seen as design practice with an end product in mind and is about solving a problem. However, design research, of which design practice can be a method, is as, as much about problem setting, developing insights and new knowledge and applying this knowledge to create impact in the world. Health is a very broad term and might be concerned with good health or ill health. It might focus on preventative health, staying healthy or curative health, managing illness. And while health is concerned with the well-being of the human body, it is increasingly concerned and related to the health of the planet. Laugh Living moved into a, a newly refurbished space outside the university campus a few years ago. We've always been keen to explore and consider where research takes place, how and where we present research, and how and where individuals experience research. We feel space, the environment, does influence how we engage with other academics, students, the general public and industry. The refurbishment of an old empty building also contributes to the reinvention of our urban centres that are in transition and our commitment to civic engagement. Our community is made up of professors, associate professors, research assistants and PhD students. Love for Living also comprises of research associates from other disciplines across the university, external experts, other higher education institutions, and the general public. The lab extends to a global community and we have developed forums to bring this diverse community together through a journal, an international conference that we have been running since 2011. And I should say we'll be hosting in Sheffield in May 2023 and our new global network. Early discussions to stage an exhibition at HKDI started in 2019 and was prompted by a significant award Lab for Living received to undertake a, a programme of research from Research England as part of their E3 pr programme, which aims were to expand excellence in England. The focus of this four-year programme of work was the 100-year life and the future home, and we received the announcement of the award in April 2019. Winston Churchill, Prime Minister of the UK during the 1940s and 50s, was quoted as saying, the farther back you can look, the farther forward you are likely to see. I think this is a, a really useful motto, especially for designers, as history, context and understanding of where we and things have come from is important to progress. It may be of interest that when we received the announcement of our award to explore the implications of the 100 year life, I immediately looked back to what was happening 100 years ago. So we received the news in April 2019. And in April 1919, exactly 100 years ago, the Bauhaus Design School was formed in Germany. And in its relatively short 15 years existence has hugely influenced and shaped design education to this day. The 100 year life, it's not necessarily about future generations living to 100 although this is likely for all babies born today, benefiting from increased medical advancements, it's more about how future generations will need to adapt to transitions over this future life and how design can support these transitions. I don't need to go into detail how disruptive and challenging the COVID pandemic has been. We live in a very different world now to that we did three years ago, but significantly our work and the theme of this exhibition has even more relevance now than it did then. We've been largely conditioned as a society to a three-stage life. We learn, we work, we retire. And these periods of life are roughly divided into three. However, the 100-year life will shift from a three-stage life to a multi-stage life. There are not unlikely to be jobs for life anymore. Many jobs people will undertake in the future haven't been invented yet. So people will learn, work, and have to undertake further learning and change careers and jobs. The financial cost of supporting an ageing population in retirement for almost a third of their life is not economically viable. So people will have to work longer into old age. And there may be more opportunities to take career breaks. 
So how can design support these changes? There is widespread support for the fact that recipients or users of products, services and spaces should be involved in some way in their creation. And there's a body of literature in support of the value of participatory and co-design. Arnstein's ladder usefully describes levels of citizen engagement. However, too often participatory engagement doesn't extend beyond the level of tokenism. So how do we engender meaningful collaborations for co-creation? The UK's Design Council's Double Diamond is a useful model that visualises the design process, a process that follows four phases, discovery, definition, development and delivery. Often citizen engagement does not appear until the problem has been identified at the intersection of these two diamonds. Lab for Living frequently involves all phases of the double diamond process, but we're particularly interested in how we collaboratively explore the problem space, the discovery phase. As mentioned, we in Lab for Living work closely with individuals and the community. However, COVID presented a real challenge to this approach, especially working with often vulnerable people and frontline health practitioners. We creatively responded by developing new ways to engage with individuals and communities and develop tools to support remote co-design. There are many benefits to this in terms of wider reach and consideration of the carbon footprint of traditional face-to-face -face meetings, but we're currently evaluating the positives and negatives of these methods that were driven by necessity through the pandemic. The exploratory phase I refer to in the double diamond process is exemplified by these artifacts created as part of a much larger collection entitled Hospitable. There has been much work on the development of technologies to support healthcare at home, although limited uptake and adoption largely due to the lack of engagement with people who will ultimately use the technology. This shift of care from the hospital to the home may have an impact on our home and its very meaning where there has been much less consideration. The home is a place of sanctuary, familiarity, belonging, a place we can escape to and a place we control. But the implications of the invasion of health technology may challenge this. The work, some of which is on display in the exhibition, envisions a future of aesthetically and functionally confusing hybrids, but importantly, act as provocations to prompt conversations to help define the real problems we need to address. And exhibitions, as is this Beyond 100 exhibition, is key to our work. Not as an endpoint, a presentation of a collection of solutions, but as we like to describe, becomes a theatre for conversation. In museums, cultural centres, universities, business centres, we adopt the exhibition as a form of gathering to create this theatre for conversation through talks, workshops, where the objects can often transcend language, disciplines and cultural boundaries. In the exhibition, you will see objects that are strange but uncomfortably familiar, but purpose of which is to challenge the typology of everyday things. The exhibition also showcases how this collaborative approach leads to real solutions and impacts people's lives. This project involved people with motor neuron disease, a condition of muscle deterioration, and neurologists. Research revealed that current devices are only worn by patients for around 10% of the time because they're uncomfortable and ugly, seen here at the bottom left of your screen. They restrict breathing, talking and eating. The design is an improvement because it's adjustable and following a two year extensive trial shows the device is being worn over 80% of the time and is now commercially available. The solution importantly makes a an important shift from a medical device to a garment, a piece of clothing that helps address issues of stigma and dignity. The collar for Philip, one of the participants and users of the collar, has been life changing in that he is able now to drive again as a result of the collar. And as he highlighted the fact that he can now look into his wife's eyes. The work of Lab for Living also uses design to help rethink and shape policy and education. Journey Through Dementia is a tangible intervention designed 
as a support program and created by occupational therapists and people with dementia for individuals at an early stage of their dementia journey to engage in meaningful activities and maintain community connectedness. Journey being through dementia is now being used by health services nationally and the program has formed the basis of international curriculum developments in the education of allied health professionals. And finally, a project that explores how design can empower local communities. Playponics is a playground co-designed and built with local people in India to encourage children to undertake physical exercise where their actions pump nutrients to feed and support the growth of plants and vegetables. This kinesthetic approach to learning has many benefits and helps support a better understanding to healthy living and sustainable environments for future generations through positive changes in behaviour. The first installations are currently being evaluated and there is interest to roll this out across large numbers of schools across the country. The model is now being explored for application in the UK. So Lab for Living explores and promotes the role of design and design research in supporting quality of life and how it might enhance our health and well-being. However, I will end with a cautionary approach. Design has a critical role in making our life safer and more enjoyable. However, it has also contributed to creating many of the world's problems. The polluting cars we drive, the huge amount of consumer waste we create, the adverts that promote unhealthy food. Just a few examples. So design, if not used thoughtfully, can be very dangerous. There are many prominent figures from the past that have heeded caution about design. In the preface to Design Participation, a Design Research Society conference hosted in Manchester in the UK in 1971, Nigel Cross wrote, professional designers in every field have failed in their assumed responsibility to predict and to design out the adverse effects of their projects. These harmful side effects can no longer be tolerated and regarded as inevitable if we are to survive the future. Have we learned? And he goes on to describe how participatory design has the potential to arrest the escalating problems of the man-made world. And I have already highlighted the value and importance of engaging diverse participants in co-design. Victor Papanek around the same time is quoted as saying, there are professions more harmful than industrial design, but only a very few of them. And Richard Neutra much earlier in his writing describes in some depth how design must be a barrier against irritation rather than an incitement to it. As I'm sure you're aware, good design often goes unnoticed, but it's bad design we often notice. So while the context of our world has changed much since these writings, many of the statements are more relevant than ever. So I trust this provides a useful background to the Beyond 100 Transforming Design and Imagining Futures exhibition. I trust you find the exhibition enjoyable and a useful learning experience. And please consider not only how design can be transforming, but also how we might need to transform design itself to achieve our goals. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Paul Chamberlain. Now we would like to welcome Mr. Uh, Dr. Michael Tan to say a few words for us as well. Dr. Tan, please. Hello, hi, um, good evening. I'm Michael. I'm from Lab for Living. I'm an associate professor with the lab. Um, it's a pleasure and honor to be here. And I would like to first and foremost thank the audience for taking time and be interested to what we have to say from Lab for Living. Um, a very big thank you to HKDI, Dr. Ong, um, for allowing us this opportunity to also share an exchange. Um, I would like to also extend my thanks to the team that has been working with us very closely, um, Jonathan and Vivian, and also um, the technical teams uh, for this lecture as well as the exhibition. Um, thank you very much. It couldn't have been possible um, without you guys. 
Um, and lastly, I reach out to my team. Uh, without you know, um, good companions of my team, uh, we will not be able to kind of like be where we are today. So a special big shout out to my lovely companion in this project, um, Nick and Graham. So thanks, guys. Um, and also for Paul uh, for entrusting me to this opportunity to actually run this project. So a little bit about what we do. So I'm going to start by just giving an overview of um, the, the exhibition that we are holding right um, at HKDI. Um, as a continuation to the idea of Beyond 100, uh, we are very interested to really question um, what design is, where we have gone, as well as to get us to rethink about what is the road that is ahead of us. So within um, the few themes that we have sort of like um, look into, right, um, as a conceptualization of the, um, the, the exhibition, right, uh, we have looked into these various themes. Um, first and foremost, I think it's a very familiar theme where we talk about the use of design research in healthcare. So it's really about looking into processes um, where we can actually look at ways to which we can offer better care through the designs of products and services. Um, the next theme that we sort of like identified through the previous work that was developed in, at the lab is under the notion of frugal design and sustainability. So this really talk about and questions right, the role of design in society, particularly the production of design. Right? Um, so it raises the question of does design always have to be expensive? Can design be frugal? And as design is being frugal, where does it reaches to? And, and that's, that's the question that we would like to think about. And more broadly, we are also thinking, you know, as we talk about health and well-being, um, we keep it open while we are focused on aging, right? Uh, in the lab, we are also very interested in the notion of life transition. So transition from adulthood to older adulthood, from childhood, right, um, to young adulthood. Um, what we do understand about health and well-being is that, you know, it's inter dependence is interrelated and it's a lifespan and it shouldn't be segregated. Um, of course, we can focus on particular kind of issues, right? But I think as we talk about health and well-being, it is important for us to be aware of the interrelatedness and the interdependence of it. Um, at the lab, right, uh, we are also very interested in processes. Uh, so it's not just hard artifact kind of design um, that we are looking at. We are also looking into like how design thinking and play in design um, could al allow us to actually express and capture data. So there's a section in, in the exhibition where you can actually see um, the works right that deals with data and then with the artifact that's being produced um, to really get us to question what then actually is the role of design uh, beyond just supporting services, you know, coming out with products um, to support the market. And last but not least, uh, which is something that I'm personally very interested in is in the notion of creative provocation. So this is where design tinkles at the brim of design and art, uh, where we are interested to also open up and question philosophical ideas around you know, what aesthetic experience actually bring in terms of conversations and debate. So using design thinking, design execution, design production, and also art processes, um, to get us to really think about our relation to the world, the social world that's around us. And my objective today in my presentation or, or in my lecture, I'll call it a talk, um, is to try to create a space for us to think about where we are and what we are doing. Um, so as an extension of Beyond 100, as much as we talk about 100 in terms of lifespan, I'm very interested to also invite us to think about beyond 100 in terms of practice. Uh, when I talk about practice, it could be your design practice. When I talk about practice, it could be our practice as educational. And when we talk about 100 years, it could also be how we go about imagining uh, ourselves in 100 years time. So the big question for me is also, do you want to live up to 100? Right? So, so I think this, these are work that I think is useful to problematize. Right? Um, so, what I'm interested to sort of like put forward today in, in this exchange is we are all familiar with the term human-centered design, right? I would like to kind of like just table this notion of human-centered design to call to attention where we are in our world today and what does human-centered means and where do we go from here, right? So 
this is a big question for everybody in the room uh, with regards to your practice. You could be an emerging designer, you could be a practicing designer, you could be an educator. Um, in, in the work that we do, right, um, there's a certain kind of spirit, there's a certain kind of approach and thinking that we bring on to the work that we do in practice, right? So we will adopt a certain kind of worldview, and this worldview can actually be formed by our education. It could be formed by our social interaction. So think about what worldviews inform your practice if you are a creative designer or you have creative practitioners, right? Because this eventually will actually shape the way we do things, the way we sort of like execute our project, right? The other thing that I thought is interesting for us to also think about is what are the principles you observe right, um, in your design practice, particularly in your design ethics. Right? I think that the main gist of today's talk right, is besides sort of like giving us this space to think about this worldview that we value, but we may not be consciously thinking about it in our practice, to review it and to also think about in the place of our world today, right, with all this complexity, um, what is the place of ethics in the work and in our practice that we do as educators, as practitioners, as emerging um, practitioners, right? So it's a provocation. Um, so for the first section, I'm going to kind of like talk a little bit about work awakening to and living in a more than human-centered world. And as I was preparing for this talk, this statement sort of like just bubble up, right, in terms of the world that we are about to live in, which is this split second, is no longer the one that we live in and has never been. So I think well, what is important here perhaps is for us to just realize that the world is actually constantly changing, whether it is visible or not. And how do we continuously adapt? How do we respond to this world that is changing? And what I would like to propose is, you know, the need for a certain kind of consciousness to be attuned to, to what is actually happening around the world so that we can better respond to it. Um, what I would like to kind of like forefront in this talk is also the idea of the risk of unthinking practice. Right? I think it, in the course of us practicing, um, there's a tendency for us to also just run off the mule, right? In terms of because it's a design project, there's a deadline, we have to kind of like finish the project. Right. But as what Paul mentioned in his slides, right, or in his presentation about the caution of design, right? Um, where does it take us and, and why we have to kind of like rethink and so like just continuously critique and, and be critical about where design is actually going. Right. Because design practices, right, thinking and decision can have unintended consequences on the environment and society, as what um, Paul has mentioned, right, um, in his presentation in terms of you know. Um, the pollutions of cars and, and the ill effects of um, the advertisement. So what I want to do here is to also try and problematize the idea of human-centered design and to raise, you know, uh, highlight the unintended consequences, particularly, right, um, how human-centered design um, is actually creating unintended kind of consequences, right, um, that is actually causing world problems, right, in terms of environmental, right, uh, in terms of social, um, that we may not be sort of like thinking about quite consciously, right? So well, what is important here is, well, prioritizing um, human comfort in the idea of human-centered design. Um, perhaps we are also running at the risk of attending to the needs of commercial drive rather than actually the planetary kind of needs because as we are fulfilling that commercial drive to come up with more product, we are also taking on resources. So I am not against human-centered um, design or processes, but I thought like as a conversation point, um, I would like to raise um, this bit here for us to actually think about the consequence of human-centered design, particularly in, in this state of the world that we are living in, which require us to maybe be aware more about the more than human-centered world that we live in, which calls into relation between human and non-human, right? which is the natural world and even like the processes that is involved in it. So it's no longer just about artifacts, it's no longer just about hardcore tangible material, but it could be also about intangible kind of um, resources and material that we have to be mindful about, 
right? Uh, because a neglect of that, which is what we are seeing now today uh, in terms of the broader ecological and social kind of um, um, deprivation or sort of degradation uh, that goes on, which damages um, the global system, right? Um, and this, at the end of it, which we can feel it today, it is November in Hong Kong and it is 20 over degrees, which is a bit unusual, right? So I think this also sort of like remind us about the more than human centered kind of world that we are actually living in today because um, of, of a consequence of human activities through production and circulation um, that has inevitably led us to where we are, which is why I'm also very interested to raise the question of, you know, where we go from here, um, moving on from human centered des design. So, what I'd like to sort of like raise here is also, you know, maybe producing more is not better. Um, and I think as, as I was reflecting on, you know, this talk here, I was thinking about the idea of, is it about doing more? Or is it about doing less, but doing more focus? Because I think we are not short of more, right? But I think what we are short of is perhaps the connection between what is the more. So perhaps, you know, this is an era where we have to kind of like think about how do we consolidate resources? How do we join up forces? How do we um, get people from different disciplines to actually come together to work in a more focused kind of manner to deliver and to address um, the issues that we are actually confronted with, right? So, but the system that we live in are integrated. So with regards to design practices, right, it is not just the practice of design itself, right? Because the practice itself is situated within a larger political economic system, right, which will then eat the design up, right? And then it caused the predicament that we are actually sort of like facing today in terms of prioritizing growth, right? With the exclusion of other factors um, that has uh, that have actually led to, you know, um, the degradation of the natural world today. Right, so what I would like to propose is then for us to recalibrate our worldviews and rethinking about practice to maybe think a little bit more about a more than human consciousness. What does it mean? Right, it means a non anthropocentric um, perspective where we take human as a component but not human as the end or human as the only um, entity that we need to consider as we talk about design practices or even education, right, in that context. So, in a non anthropocentric perspective, right, as we talk about human as a component, there are like a group of philosophical works around that, uh, which I think is interesting, which actually acknowledges that our experience of living in this world is actually um, attributed, right, by a network of things, a relations of things that actually come together that will shape the outcome, right, for an example, in terms of health, right, as we put certain material together, that material could cause good health or the material could cause bad health. For example, in a product, we could be using a certain kind of material, which eventually, initially we thought, you know, is a good material, but after much uses, um, it actually result in bad health. So that's what we were talking about, you know, in terms of thinking about the relationship, right, between material, right, and human being and the natural world. Right. So well, what is interesting about this thinking is also um, acknowledging right, um, the complex interdependencies of human and non-human actants right, and the interdependence of contextual perspective. So what it wants us to, encourages us to do is to also adapt a, a certain sense of openness right, um, in terms of our practice so that we can actually learn um, from each other in terms of disciplines in terms of practices to inform and to sort of like review the way we actually practice in, in our world, right? So as an ethos of engagement, right, and as an analytical tool for us to think about the world, if you are interested in this way of thinking, um, you could actually refer to uh, the Landa's assemblage um, theory, or it could be actor network theory or object-oriented ontology. Um, to really get you to start to think about relations of things and matters in the world from human to non-human. Um, well, what, what is important for us to know is that with that contingency, right, it will also shape and determine the potential of things to become good or bad. Yep. I'm running out of time. So what, what I would like to sort of like um, maybe just round things up a little bit 
is for us to be thinking about how can we rethink about our practice as designers and even as educators, um, how do we go about teaching um, the younger generations that is coming up in terms of the next 100 years for design education? Um, how do we rethink practice to create a more nuanced, holistic and considered approach for students right, um, as they do design in the work so that they are more aware of the interrelatedness between design practice and the more than human world right, um, that they exist in. Um, it's also really about adopting post-disciplinary stance and openness, right, and, uh, and ability and openness to learn um, from other disciplines. Uh, lastly, I think what, what is important here is perhaps to get us to rethink about the place of ethics in design education. Um, is it necessary? In the world that we live in today, uh, with all this complexity, right, um, this is something that I think uh, might be useful for us to think about given the complexities um, that is challenging us today. Um, is that a place for students, um, even for us practitioners, right? Um, does it actually have a space in our curriculum to talk about that? Because like, you know, in, in medicine, for example, um, you have medical ethics, right? Which really sort of like give um, medical practitioner a space to think about what they do. Um, so perhaps, you know, in the hundred years that is to come, maybe that is my hope for design and creative practice is to really engage us um, creative practitioners to be, have that space to actually talk about, you know, um, what we believe in, why we do what we are doing, and what we hope to achieve um, as we do what we are doing. All right, how am I running with time? I'm done. <laughs> okay, sorry, I have to sort of like just rush through it. Thank you, Dr. Tang, and please remain on stage. We are also honored to have Dr. Tang to chair the sharing section tonight. Um, let, us give a, let us all give a warm welcome as Hong Kong DI academic staff come to the stage to speak about four design projects related to healthcare. They are Mr. Bim Learn, Senior Lecturer of Department of Arch Architecture Interior and Product Design, Hong Kong DI. Mr. Kelvin Kem, Lecturer of Department of Architecture, Interior and Product Design, Hong Kong DI. Mr. Edwin Wong, Lecturer of Department of Communication Design, Hong Kong DI. All right, um, I have the good company of um, my colleagues from HKDI who would now go on to share with us uh, some of the projects that they have actually done with um, students in this institution. So first and foremost, I'd like to invite Bim yes. to share your journey you. with students. Thank you very much. So uh, if you don't mind, I would stand up instead um, because actually you don't know who's talking with the mask. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks again, and today I'm going to present uh, one of our students' projects. Uh, the, the student actually uh, graduated in 2020, and if you remember what happened in 2020, uh, he started his project actually in the January of 2020, and that's the time when the pandemic came. So let's start with it. Um, it's a project called the Yun Set. Well, actually, it's a set of uh, Chinese uh, tableware, which try to enhance the bonding between uh, family when they are having a Chinese dinner. And uh, you can see uh, the final design is a quite stylish one uh, with a very strong branding. I think I will start with the video first so you get an overview on this.
Thank you. Um, basically, this is, well, 2020 pandemic uh, when we are having online classes. And our student, Elvin, basically stay at home for a lot of time. And, uh, well, it, which is pretty good for pandemic where he liked to talk more with his mom, especially when she's cooking and preparing the dinner. So what he find that actually is very simple uh, user research, talk to his mom and find that actually they have a lot of problem when they're cooking and sharing. So this is how he started. He started uh, experimenting and making models, trying to find out which is the best way to reduce the stress on the weights. There's a lot of testing done, a lot of user research, user testing with the prototype. And uh, at that time, it's online. Everything has to be simple, so the prototype is just cardboard. And come out to have the final design on the uh, with the cap model. Um, so you find that this is one of one part of the um, tableware, uh, which is the boat and the dish. Of course, you have other things, including the chopsticks and other bones, bowl things like that. Uh, but it just get too much, so I cannot present it here. Uh, there has been a lot of different um, methodology using. It's been a user research with empathy. There's been a user journey studied. There's a lot, lot of prototyping testing uh, with the user testing, and uh, and then and then we have this design, and we luckily get an award in the Red Dog, and then we also luckily to have this project to go on. So we all know that there's good design there. But good design, we have to be challenged. If you want it to be a successful design, you have to take up the challenge on technology, production, and the market. So I'm more than happy to say it. We go through the first step. We go through the second step to produce. And we are going to the first step to market. This is the production piece of the ginseng. So starting from the first stage, uh, research up to this production, start from 2020 and then now 2022. And basically you can find this on the market later. Well, the last things that I want to mention is, if you look at this one, hey, it's not the whole set, right? Uh, I think there are manufacturers here. You know what's the reason? Production, costing, market, you have to test the market, who's going to take the risk? So uh, I know that there are investors here, there are CEO from the manufacturing sector. If you'd like to further in invest on the production of this one, please contact me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bim. Um, next, I would like to invite Kelvin um, to share the work that he has been working on with student Embrace and Tri King. Hi, thank you. I'm going to share two projects. Uh, this one is called Embrace. Um, this actually this is a uh, baby trolley for the visually impaired parents. John is the designer. The project start. Um, we got a chance to visit the visually impaired people in the Hong Kong Society of the Blind, and thank you, Edwin, to line up everything. And in this occasion, um, the student learn or understand the daily life of the visually impaired people. And in the middle is Kitty. Kitty is a, has a baby girl. And after a few weeks' time, the student did some homework and go back to visit the uh, visually impaired people again. And after the talk, they got two very important insights about what's going on they should do on the new projects. Such as Kitty said, hey, the existing baby trolley actually broke my wheel. And he always want to touch her baby girl. Based on these two points, and, and the third point is also very important in a way that 
uh, visually impaired does not totally is not totally blind. They can see a certain view. So based on this direction, John start his design journey. He also wear the wear a glass to pretend to be visually impaired, so that he can understand more. Uh, this prototype actually is very dangerous. It can kill a baby. <laughs> and the work goes on. We always encourage our students to make a prototype. And once you got a prototype, you've, you've spot the problem. It is very huge and impractical. And the circle is that, I, I just pointed out that, actually, you're embracing the body of the baby. But does it necessary to be that? Because Kitty said she just wants to touch the baby. I like this picture because John is really trimmed down the prototype inch by inch. Did, here comes the another prototype, a very quick model. Actually, touch but the head is part of the body. <laughs> we we cannot separate the head and the body. So you can compare. The size is more reasonable. This quick dummy can tell. And after that, John go to the detail, styling, prototype. And this diagram you will see, the existing baby trolley actually really broke the wheel of Kitty. And the new design solved the problem. So touching the baby is good. But on the other hand, it creates another issue. What happened if my hand is, is not on the baby trolley? So we apply a reverse brake mechanism into the design, like what we do in the um, uh, airport uh, luggage trolley. When your hand is off, the brake, I mean, the, the trolley would be stopped. So this is John's design. And we hope uh, Kitty and her uh, baby girl can enjoy good time outdoor more. Next project is Triking. Jordan, nice looking guy. Uh, he started with these projects. And this is an existing uh, product available in the market uh, for someone who need it. And actually, uh, the fam one of the, a young family member of uh, Jordan need this product. But this product. Um, this has a negative labeling effect on the user. It doesn't look good. You don't want to use it because it, it tells other people that, hey, you, 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 are, you are disabled. It doesn't make you feel good. So based on this direction, eliminate the negative uh, labeling effect. He start the project. His sketch is beautiful and did a lot of testing. Of course, we encourage students to make prototype to test. And come to a point, he make this prototype, the structure is very good, very stable. But it seems that Jordan get lost. We want to eliminate the negative labeling effect. But look at the product, I mean the prototype, it's thick as my arm. It's a powerful weapon. So I bring my hiking pole to Jordan and tell him, hey, this is very thin, but it can support your body. So he changed the scale, developed more styling, did this the prototype, and did this Jordan and his striking. Thank you. Thank you, Kelvin. Um, next, I'd like to invite Edwin. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Dr. On, guests, uh, colleagues, and also students. My name is Edwin. Uh, I'm the project coordinator of this uh, project, VR for Pain Management, and uh, also with the leadership of uh, Michael Chan. And uh, later on, I will tell you more about how this uh, um, interdisciplinary project 
can uh, enhance our students' learning uh, during the last year, the whole year process. And uh, as said, uh, we adopted uh, the PBL problem, uh, project based learning approach uh, with, with the interdisciplinary uh, uh, ideas to, um, to have the uh, digital media students as well as the health and life science students together uh, to, um, to approach a problem, a human centered problem, that um, those patients in the clinics, uh, their fear of uh, having um, those small scale sur uh, surgeries. Uh, during those pro uh, process that uh, like the painful uh, concept or the experience uh, stopped them uh, to go to those uh, uh, process. So um, with, with the PBL approach, we have uh, uh, Dr. Tony Chen as our consultant um, for our students to have uh, the interview and also the observation about how to tackle the problem. And of course, uh, we, we use the methodology of design thinking um, by uh, using uh, the user uh, research process to understand more about uh, how patients feel. And um, well, the, the concept is uh, the VR therapy is uh, now uh, being used uh, in this profession uh, field. And uh, in different uh, research uh, results, uh, it is proven that uh, this is one of the ways to release the anxiety and the painful experience of the patients. Uh, before we go into the details, uh, please uh, show that two minutes video. Uh, it is in Cantonese, and uh, I'm sorry about that, but uh, later on I will elaborate more about what the video said. Okay, please. 今時今日,怎樣舒緩病人的心理壓力 在這個project裏面,其實我們都做了很多探討 其實整個過程加強了他們跟不同的人的溝通、團隊合作、和其他的都同業界有些溝通,其實都是一個很好的情況。在專業性方面,我們會諮詢醫生、訪問親身體驗過的病人和學生,以蒐集數據令這個計
two out of six are for children, so they can pick their own uh, 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 scenario. Uh, this is a kind of uh, the MRI adventure series that the children's hospital is now using, that the patients can have that um, 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 own, have his or, own or her own choice to select which scenario that they, they want to go through or which uh, music uh, or colors uh, scenarios that they, they want to have. And this is what we call user-centered uh, UX design. And uh, I, I'm very pleased that uh, in this project, we have around um, 60 uh, students from different disciplines, um, the, the design discipline and also the health and life science discipline students. They can uh, exchange ideas, compare notes, and also learn other uh, disciplines, uh, professional knowledge or, or vocabularies to understand in the real world, uh, well, in PBL, in the real world, they have to work with uh, other professions in order to provide a user-centered solution uh, for the users. And, uh, and thank you for the management support that we have some funding uh, for the result uh, to display uh, the whole thing. So uh, in the advanced design studio in, in August, just the past August, uh, we had uh, this exhibition. And the exhibition uh, was, uh, we, we worked with students to, to come up with the ideas of this immer immersion uh, experience that the uh, audience, they can um, uh, get themselves into the box, the black boxes, and then to, to feel or to watch uh, and to listen to the whole uh, user, uh, the journey of that uh, uh, diving experience. And uh, just uh, in October, and just in October, uh, we had this uh, uh, exhibition uh, set up in uh, Ivy Kwai Chung campus uh, in the health tech center that uh, the uh, HLS students and the colleagues in that campus uh, would know how this project, interdisciplinary uh, design thinking, UX uh, design and PBL project uh, could be implemented into our curriculum. And uh, thank you for all the uh, our colleagues and also students who are uh, involved in this uh, meaningful project. Thank you very much. Thank you, Edwin. Are we doing okay with time? All right. Um, are there any pressing questions um, that the audience would like to ask our presenters? And Paul will join us. Hi, Paul. Hello, everybody. Hi. You can hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear. That's great. I think they're going to try and put you on screen. Um, do you have any questions that you'd like to sort of like ask our panelists? If not, I can get the ball going first and then we could have a chat. Is he still there? Sorry, is that pointed to me? Yeah. Like, do you have any questions for them? If not, then I, I would get the ball rolling. <laughs> yeah, get the ball rolling, Michael, I think. All right. <laughs> um, I think this is a question for students. Uh, no, it's a question on behalf of students, right? Um, so, so I would like maybe to invite the panelists to share in your observation of the world, what has changed? What might be the challenges that come with this change that you have observed and where the opportunities are that you think students should start to look out for? I guess you can start first. Um, well, it's changed, obviously. We are wearing masks, right? <laughs> so um, things get changed really quickly. So but my answer, I mean, uh, from my point of view, I, I do think there are changes. If you ask me what changed, well, you can see what changed. If you ask me furthermore, I would say prepare for the change. So I cannot tell how this work will change, but I can tell that actually it will be changing more frequently. So for our student here, well, we teach you something, uh, you learn something. But the point is self-learning is most important because it changes tomorrow. We are, we are actually teaching some, um, that is difficult part. 
we were teaching some software, right? A few years ago, we started teaching this software. A few years later, all this software get free, and there are new free software going on. So things change every minute. So prepare for the change that will be what I'm thinking. Uh, the students should be. Thank you. Um, Edwin or Kelvin? So what do you think has changed and where, where the opportunities might be for well, students? Actually, I would like to use uh, my student Jordan's project as an uh, example. Uh, when he began his project, the, pro I mean, the product that solved the people's problem already exists. And the cost of the product is cheap, but unfortunately, the, the, the look is ugly. <laughs> and uh, it exaggerated the stability of user. And that's why Jordan has the opportunity to come up with a nicer design. So I think uh, people are demanding more. They are aware their image more. And that's why um, our students should be better designer. Thank you, Kelvin. Um, Edwin? I think the opportunity is, uh, well, I have, I have a chance to provide uh, design thinking um, training to uh, different sectors right now, and uh, to government, to industry, and also to, to commercial sectors. And people are asking, um, could, we, could we do a better user-centered service or user-centered design? For for target users, uh, not not designers, but even the the government officials. How how can I provide a more user centered services service for for the people? So um, I, I think the the big opportunity uh, is um, could we co work or for the for the young people? Uh, we got to learn and got to know how to work with others to provide a good user-centered design with good user-centered value for, for people. Thank you. Thank you, Edwin. Um, anybody from the audience would like to? Yes, there's a hand there. Can we, do you want to shout or could we pass a microphone? Feel free to introduce yourself. Oh, hello. Thank you, everyone. Hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for hosting this my pleasure for, for today. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm Phil. I'm from uh, HADI. I'm from the jewelry design. Um, um, you, you all guys focus on uh, the all the projects, uh, all focus on the uh, user experience, right? Um, sometimes I, I, I'm wondering some, uh, uh, it maybe also, the, um, some designs focus on um, uh, asking participants uh, to feedback, uh, giving, some, uh, giving us some feedbacks. Um, is it? Is there any difference between uh, um, co-design and just asking uh, people as um, giving feedbacks to, to the designers? I w uh, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm a bit confused about that. <laughs> so this is a question about: Is there a distinction between co-design and user sort of like feedback in a design process? Thank you, Phil. So, uh, from my knowledge, um, co design basically, you are having the design activities with the petitioner. So, who is the designer? So, everybody is the designer because they are taking part in the design. So, if you're just asking, interview, getting data, who's the designer? You are the designer. The others, you just interview and get the data. So, that's what I think about. Yeah. Thanks, Bin. Yeah. Anybody wants to come in? 
um, co-design. Um, I think there are two uh, or three concepts behind that. The first one is uh, design to the people. So that is not uh, really the co-design to, to them. And the second thought is uh, design for them. So it's a kind of involving them to, to provide feedbacks or even involve them. But I think the most uh, important one that uh, we are delivering the message to our students is uh, design with them, design with the people. So they really invo are involved in the whole process, not only by the end of the stage to provide feedback, but at the very beginning, they, they tell you what their pain points are. Then we start, we start that project with, with them. So, and during the process, they, they are the designers, but not the clients or not the users. Mm -hmm. So that, that's to me the idea of co-design. Yeah. yeah, Kelvin? Yeah. Well, actually, um, I use my students' project as an example again. Uh, John's project, uh, Embrace, actually, from the beginning and the middle and the uh, even after the prototype is finished, we visited Kitty more than four or five times. So we gather a lot of information from her to hope to continuously improve the product, actually. So involving the user is critical, actually. That's my, my com comment on that. Thank you. Thank you, Kelvin. Paul, would you like to comment on code design and user feedback? Yeah, just to extend on what's already been said, really, I, I think um, get, getting feedback from, from end users is, is more like consultation. Um, and, and in a way, the designers already made some decisions. Um, and then that might even be the, the, the kind of defining what the problem is. But I think, as has been mentioned with the panel, co-design is, is a, a collaboration throughout the project where it might be identifying the, the need, identifying the problems together, and then working together to find a solution. Obviously, the designers has got the, the technical skills um, to kind of visualize the ideas of maybe the participants, but it should be conceptually uh, delivered together. Um, but I, I showed in my presentation a ladder, Arnstein's ladder, and it showed the kind of levels of, of participation and true collaboration. And I think it's been proven if you involve the people who are going to use or be affected by a design, if you involve them in early in the process and throughout the process, it's more likely to be a success at the end of the day. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, I hope that answers your question. So I think it's, it's a more sort of like an outlook towards, you know, acknowledging agency and democracy in the design process, which is important. Uh, Michael has the... Do we Thank you. So uh, I, I am very interested in uh, one of the uh, ideas in your presentation is the OOO, mm. uh, Object Orientating uh, Onology. So uh, actually, uh, our school uh, have uh, some workshop, little workshop starting this year on these things. And uh, I want to know, uh, uh, how about in uh, Chateau Harlem? So do you have any uh, exploration in this area or what is the outcome? Uh, we don't, but I think philosophically there's an orientation towards that way of thinking, right, in terms of um, the more than human looking at a assemblage, right, um, and also looking at actor network theory, because I think in OOO, um, it is really precisely focusing on looking at objects relation as, as a starting point. Right, whereas um, the other theories, such as actor network theory or assemblage theory, look into material culture and the material world and the natural resources in a broader kind of way. So I think in, in terms of scope, uh, there's definitely room for us to explore in, in that manner. Yeah, because it is just a, a framing in terms of you know the, the specificity of where that inquiry, what that inquiry is actually based on. But I think the thinking around acknowledging that relation between the object and more than the object kind of world um, is this that line of inquiry. 
hope it answers your question. Are we doing all right with time? Or all right, um, I'm afraid we ran out of time. Thank you for your participation, panels. Thanks, Paul. Um, I would like to now hand the mic back into our student MC. Thank you all for the fascinating presentation.